thank you very much. Um, so we're going to move on to our second panel. Um, and thank you both to the first speakers for being so perfectly on time and for the audience for coming back in. We're only running a couple of minutes late, which is good. Um, so again, two speakers who I think will probably be known to everybody in the room, so I will be very brief, and to say it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you uh, John Spencer um, from the University of Cambridge, Professor Emeritus, CBQC as well, and uh, Professor David Ormerod, QC, the current Law Commissioner. Um, and I, I don't think it's, for the sake of uh, form, I will mention that uh, David is a, a member of the civil service, sufficient to say that there are PERDA rules that apply to him. So if he does decline a question or doesn't answer in the way that one would dream that he would, giving all of his detailed views, um, that's because he's bound, that might be because he's bound by law to do you no know, uh, difference. Because it's a hard question. Not because <laughs> I've given that open a possibility. So uh, without further ado, John. Thank you, Matt. Well, I applauded your enterprise in setting this up and accepted willingly your invitation to come and speak. And I put forward this topic as something that I have been up excited about for many years. And then I came to preparing a paper. I realised I had been writing about this since 1982. I think my first paper I sent to Andrew Ashworth when he was editor of the Criminal Law Review and I've written about six papers on it, and I basically said all I have to say. <laughs> and so, really, hence you've got a rather scrappy outline instead of a paper. And I can start by looking back over, over it for the last 35 years or so. And I hope I could be permitted to slightly risk a joke which expresses my feelings. There was this very pious... Jew who was discovered in Jerusalem who'd been praying at the Wailing Wall every day for 70 years. And the local press got hold of that and they interviewed him and they said, well, tell us what you've been praying for all this time. And he said, well, I've been praying for understanding between Muslims, Jews and Christians. I've been praying for peace in the world. I've been praying that children should respect their parents. And I've been praying that politicians should be honest. And um, the journalist said, so how do you feel having prayed for this all this time? And he replied, as if I'd been talking to an effing wall. <laughs> um, and has anything changed in all the time that I've been involved in talking about uh, criminal appeals? Yes, actually, a few things. And to my mind, they've all been good changes. We've had the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which has certainly helped with the problem of genuine miscarriages of justice. We've had the introduction of prosecution appeals against over-lenient sentences in a limited number of cases, and I think that's a good thing. Uh, we've had certain increase in prosecution rights of appeal in cases on indictment. I think that was probably a good thing. But on the whole, the big picture is still a mess, to my way of thinking, as it was when I started. And I'm just going to tell you very quickly why before I turn to several particular things which um, upset me at the moment. Um, we've got two systems of appeal in criminal cases, one from summary trial, one from trial on indictment, and they each seem to answer points of basic principle in different directions. Right of appeal or appeal by leave only open-ended right of appeal from the magistrates to the Crown Court by the convicted defendant against conviction or sentence, leave by appeal only, given with great restraint if you're appealing from a conviction or against a sentence on indictment. The nature of the appeal process, is it a rehearing or is it simply a review of the procedure at first instance? It's one way round from summary trial, it's just a review of the file basically if it's from proceedings on indictment. This isn't written down anywhere, but it is undoubtedly the case that the rules about the burden of proof are different. The defendant has the courage to appeal from the magistrates to the Crown Court. It's a rehearing and the Crown have to reprove his guilt. On the other hand, though, it's not written down anywhere in the Criminal Appeal Act or anywhere else if the defendant is appealing to the Court of Appeal against something that happened on indictment, he has the burden of persuading the Court of Appeal that something's wrong and has to be put right. Nulla reformatio in peos, as the Continentals say. You mustn't expose people to the right to the risk of a heavier conviction if they appeal, heavier penalty if they appeal. General rule in continental criminal justice, 
A rule we apply in appeals on indictment, the defendant can't have his sentence increased if he appeals against it um, from the Crown Court to the Court of Appeal, but he certainly can if he does from the magistrates to the Crown Court. Everybody is warned in the magistrates' court that the Crown Court could increase the sentence, and that plus what I call the sodit factor, the fact that it's probably easier to pay the £100 fine than bother with an appeal, <coughs> means only a tiny number of people ever exercise their rights of appeal from magistrates' courts to the Crown Court. And then very differential treatment, I won't go into how, from the position of the Crown, whether we're talking about the summary system or appeals on indictment. And on top of that, it's so complex, so many different statutes, no way of grasping it except by taking Archbold or Blackstone and having a really good read or just going into practice. Um, well, I could talk for a long time about all that, but I won't. I'm just going to turn to several things which trouble me at the moment. First is the rules on interlocutory appeals in proceedings on indictment. I was thinking about this as we were coming over today. I suppose originally proceedings on indictment, all the pre-trial business took place in the magistrates' courts and things that happened there were susceptible of judicial review. And once it got to what is now the Crown Court, Assizes or Quarter Sessions, it all went through like the proverbial dose of salts and it couldn't be stopped. And it all had to be done within a very limited time frame, so no way were any interlocutory appeals allowed from what is now the Crown Court. Anyway, there weren't any interlocutory proceedings there, really. Um, bit by bit, we've changed that. Um, the Crown now has a general right to appeal against what are usually called inaccurately terminated, terminating rulings in proceedings in the Crown Court. If the trial judge, for example, stops the case as an abusive process, or if the trial judge rules there's no case to answer, the Crown can challenge that with an interlocutory appeal to the Court of Appeal, and they sometimes do. Um, if he stops the case because there's no case to answer, because the judge has wrongly held a piece of evidence inadmissible, which is admissible, the Crown can have a go and go to the Court of Appeal and it can be sent back. Strangely, it seems to me, the Crown has no right to challenge a judge's decision under Section 51 and Schedule 3 of the Crime and Disorder Act to allow a defence application to dismiss for want of evidence. There is a special procedure created when a committal proceedings by the magistrates in their old form were got rid of, under which a defendant who's facing trial in the Crown Court can apply to the judge to uh, stop the case for want of evidence of a crime that's been committed. And there's no appeal against that. The only thing the Crown can do is to try to issue a voluntary bill of indictment to have another go. This came to my attention because of the Evans saga uh, three years ago. Um, Evans and others in South Wales were prosecuted for conspiracy to defraud, the Crown alleging these to be the facts. Evans and company were directors of a company that did open-cast coal mining in South Wales, and they'd had permission to run a number of open-cast mines under strict conditions that they put it all back afterwards. And it was going to cost many millions to do that. And part of the terms of the conditions was that the company through which they did it stored in a special bank account a large sum of money against the eventual costs. And the Crown case was that Evans and Company had worked out a wangle under which they set up shell companies in the British Virgin Islands, which were really themselves and had no assets at all. They pretended these companies were companies which were genuinely into the business of restoring sites. They'd got the company to sell to these bogus companies the sites, together with, they hoped, the obligations to restore the sites. And then they'd persuaded their auditors on the basis that this, these were all genuine transactions to say it was okay to liquidate the funds that had been put aside 
for their company to restore the site, and surprise, surprise, large slices of this money then found its way back into the pockets of the directors who thought up the scheme. Conspiracy to defraud, charged as conspiracy to defraud the local authorities who've given planning permission and the National Coal Authority who've given the license. That's to say, conspiracy to make it impossible in practice for them actually to enforce the conditions of the license. Mr Justice uh, Hickenbottom, in a long erudite judgment, said it didn't amount to a conspiracy to defraud. You couldn't have, there wasn't a sufficient interest in these people to be defrauded. And then the Crown tried to have a voluntary bill of indictment and that failed and it ended up with the serious fraud office being done for vast costs in favour of these defendants. <coughs> Then the Court of Appeal, in a case called uh, the first stage of the Hayes prosecution, the fraud case against Hayes over Libor rigging, had Hickenbottom's decision cited to them, and they said, we think that decision's wrong. But if the decision was wrong, and the Crown could actually prove this case, this was a very shocking miscarriage of justice at the public expense, wasn't it? But it couldn't be challenged. Surely we ought to, at very least to change the rules about interlocutory appeals to the extent of allowing the Crown to take to the Court of Appeal such a ruling. The defence basically don't have any right, don't have any equivalent right to appeal against an interlocutory ruling that goes the other way, a refusal to stop the case as an abusive process, a refusal to accept a ruling, a submission of no case, a, a, a decision to admit evidence which is legally admissible on which the case basically turns, and so on. They've got a very limited right in the context of a preparatory hearing under that special procedure under the Criminal Justice Act 1987 and the Criminal Procedure and Investigations Act 1995, but not otherwise, which means if a ruling goes against them, they then just have to um, get on with it, and if there's a conviction, attempt to get the conviction overturned at the end. That's always seemed tough to me, particularly when taken with the rule that the defend that sentences are immediately executed, and in such a case, even if the Court of Appeal finally gives them right and quashes the conviction, the defendant is likely to have spent time in prison. We surely need to rethink the rules about who has what kind of interlocutory appeal and where in respect of proceedings in the Crown Court leading up to a trial on indictment. Next building from what we heard a lot about before the break, appeals to the Court of Appeal in quotes, change of law cases. Appeals by people whose time for appealings run out on the basis that the law has now reinterpreted in some way more leniently than it had been thought to be when they were convicted. Say they shouldn't have been convicted, please, and can they appeal out of time um, in order to have the benefit of the rule as restated more favourably to them. The Supreme Court in Jogi, regurgitating well-known case law on leave to appeal out of time in such cases, said this could only be done where there was, where a substantial injustice would result from its refusal, and they thought that that wasn't likely to be the case very often in the Jovi scenario, and indeed the Court of Appeal told us so in the case of Johnson and others when they managed to kick back a whole list of attempts by defendants who'd been directed, whose juries had been directed under the uh, pre-Jovi formula, tried to say, come on, give us another go, and um, having talked about this substantial injustice test, the Court of Appeal said, in determining whether that high threshold, they said it's a jolly high threshold to be met, the Court will primarily and ordinarily have regard to the strength of the case advanced that the charge, advanced that the change in the law would in fact have made a difference if crime A is a crime of violence, which the jury concluded must have involved the use of a weapon, so that the inference of participation with an intention to cause really serious harm is strong, that is likely to be very difficult, and one by one they picked off each of the defendant's attempts to appeal and said they weren't going to give them another go for the jury to be directed um, under the new Jogi formula. 
Tough? Well, it is rather tough, but I suppose you have to remember resources are limited, and um, there would have been a lot of them, and if they quashed the convictions, they'd have had to order retrials, and frankly, God knows what juries are going to do in murder or manslaughter cases anyway, and they may have thought, well, we just can't have that. But they put the lid on it firmly in a case in Garwood which said there's no appeal to the Supreme Court in respect of rulings of law made on an application for leave to appeal. So it all sticks there, as it did in Johnson. And much worse, to my mind, in the case of Ordu, they interpreted the substantial injustice test to mean the defendant must basically still be in prison. Ordu was convicted of an immigration offence under a view of the law which was right at the time. He pled guilty on legal advice, which was correct according to the law at the time. But a House of Lords case reinterpreted the law afterwards in such a way as he would certainly have had a defence if the case came up now. And there's no question that he would have been acquitted. In fact, the Crown indicated in the appeal in order that they weren't going to contest the appeal if leave was given. And the Court of Appeal said, substantial injustice, well, he served his sentence now, hasn't he? What's he got to lose? He's just going to rake it up again. I mean, let him get on with his life. I keep on thinking to a well-known remark by Lord Atkin in a civil case about appeals, which he said, finality is a good thing, but justice is surely a better one. And even if we can swallow Johnson and Garwood, I find it very difficult to swallow or do, and I wish the Court of Appeal would take a less restrictive attitude in these change of law cases. Thirdly, and more complicated, and something I could talk about at much greater length if I had the time and had trouble to prepare a detailed paper, the limited powers of the Court of Appeal to deal in an intelligent way with procedural errors that affect the trial. The Court of Appeal Criminal Division, like its predecessor, the Court of Criminal Appeal, is a creature of statute, and it doesn't have any kind of general power like the Court of Appeal Civ Div seems to have um, to kind of sort it out in any way that seems sensible. It can only do what the Criminal Appeal Act basically says it can or other statutory provisions. And in essence, it can dismiss the appeal because it thinks the conviction was not unsafe. It can quash the conviction because it thinks the conviction was unsafe or annul the conviction if the proceedings were found to be completely void. It can substitute a conviction for a different offence sometimes, but actually only in quite a narrow range of circumstances if you read the Criminal Appeal Act Section 3 and 3A and it can quash the conviction and order a retrial since 1988. That wasn't possible when I started writing about all this. But that limited menu doesn't always enable it to deal sensibly with some cases that arise, including quite often, well, maybe not quite often, certainly sometimes, appeals in cases where the defendant was convicted of the wrong offence, rightly convicted, but of the wrong offence. They can only substitute a conviction in the limited framework of sections 3 and 3A of the Criminal Appeal Act, and you'll see one of those cases where they can't is if the jury have actually acquitted him of the right offence. So if you get a case where the Crown, are not quite sure how the evidence is going to come out, charge him, count one, this. Alternatively, count two, that. And the judge misdirects the jury that it isn't a this, but it might be a that, and they convict of the that, and the jury have acquitted on the this, then they can't substitute a conviction for the this. How silly, isn't it? Or the best they can do is cross the conviction and send it back for a retrial. What a waste of public time and money. Surely they should just be able to substitute a conviction for something else. Frankly, I can't see why the Court of Appeal can't have a power like the trial judge does, even up to the very end of proceedings at a trial, to amend the indictment. If the indictment was defective, 
And that's the ground of appeal. Why can't the Court of Appeal say, oh, yes, it does matter a bit, doesn't it? Mm, we can't have that. Well, let's have a pen and put it right, shall we? That would be the sensible thing, wouldn't it? More generally, and this would take longer to expand too, I question how intelligently the system is able to deal with appeals grounded on misdirections of law or misreceptions or wrongful refusals of evidence. Because the Court of Appeal, in such cases, has a choice between quashing the conviction or allowing the appeal or allowing the appeal and ordering a retrial. But they never know the facts which the jury actually found, and they never know really whether the misdirection or the decision to reject the evidence or the decision, decision to admit the evidence actually made any difference. So they have to guess. And that means they either have to make a hard-nosed decision which isn't intellectually honest, which I don't think happens so much now they can order a retrial, and say, oh, it can't have made any difference when we might have done. Or alternatively, um, they have to order a retrial, um, which is expensive. And it's already different from what happens if there's allegedly some error in magistrate's court's proceedings and there's a case stated to the divisional court where the justices will make a list of their findings of fact. And then they'll say, having found these facts, we thought the legal rule was this, and then we applied the legal rule to those facts, and that's the answer, please how do we get on? Is it a first? Is it a 2-1? Is it a 2-2? Two, two? Is it a third? Is it a fail? And, they, and the administrative court will do whatever is necessary. But again, that is tied up very much with the issue of, um, the issue of um, unreasoned verdicts. Um, juries don't give reasons for verdicts because juries don't give reasons for verdicts. We don't know really whether they were influenced at all, so we have to guess. And if it's... Um, it has unsatisfactory um, onward effects on the appeal process. I mustn't talk much longer, but very briefly, the last one, and that makes me crossest of all, is the reluctance of the system to award compensation to people who were convicted and whose convictions were quashed. Once upon a time, the rule was that the Home Office had a general discretion to award compensation um, ex gratia to anybody who was thought to have been hard done by, by the criminal justice system. They had to grovel a bit for it, and it was ex gratia. Thank you, Your Majesty, for doing that. But nevertheless, there weren't any limits to the circumstances in which they could get it. Um, we then entered into an international convention which required us to give them a right to compensation in certain very narrow circumstances, which we enacted, which we gave statutory form in section 133 of the Criminal Justice Act 1988, and the Labour government in 2006 said, we're abolishing the ex gratia scheme as all part of rebalancing justice in favour of the victim and right membering thinkers of society. What stirred them up was, apparently, that the Daily Mail had been agitating about the fact that some victims of crime got less in compensation than was being dished out under the ex gratia scheme to victims of miscarriage of justice. So the way to get rid of that was to basically abolish compensation for miscarriages of justice. <laughs> and then, so it's for only on the statutory scheme and you only get compensation under that if, it's, if your conviction's quashed outside the ordinary appeal process on the discovery of new evidence. So if the Court of Appeal just quashed the conviction under the normal procedural rules following a cock up by the trial judge, no way you get miscarriage of justice compensation. And furthermore, the defendant must show uh, beyond reasonable doubt that he is innocent. And people just don't get compensation now. And put that together with the rule that people, um, that people are sent off to prison immediately and prison sentences aren't usually suspended pending appeals. And I think it's very harsh indeed. Um, Somebody quoted back at me something I'd written once about all this, and I said, in this country, the, our version of the presumption of innocence is the maintenance of a lot of archaic rules of procedure and evidence which ensure the acquittal of a substantial number of the guilty, and then we treat everybody who's acquitted as if they're <coughs> really guilty. And it seems to me that our mean rules about compensations for miscarriage of justice are the classic example 
I'm sorry, I've slightly overshot my time, Matthew, and I'll pause there. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.